Ah, eso. Awesome. Yeah, I guess we can just kick it off, right? It's um, <clears throat> actually two minutes early, so uh, that's great. Uh, yeah, NX, uh, NX Workspace, NX Mono Repo. Do the lasers again. This is, uh, <laughs> this is why you pay Let's premium go. to Apple to get like <laughs> this. this. This happens all the time where I put like thumbs up, not even like this, but I'm explaining something, counting or something, and then it'll bubble there's up a, the... There's a hearts too, right? Yeah, NX. Somewhere. Me and NX. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I just checked, just for reference, uh, the initial announcement for NX. Uh, NX got launched in 2017. And um, the guys who built it, Jeff B. Cross and Victor Safkin, are ex engineers from Google, and they worked at the Angular team. And um, they then, in 2016, they left the Angular team and they started their own business consultancy agency, agency <clears throat> where they would focus on Angular. So helping apps uh, helping companies succeed with angular um and clearly companies have different concerns than uh, a normal dev in a one-off one-off app uh, uh like if you want to build like really scalable apps and then after about a year of doing this they build a set of tools which was an extension on the angular cli and x uh, angular extension was normal extensions was the 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 product called narwhal is the name of the company uh, so this is kind of a history, and for a few years it was like mainly an NX tool, uh, a, a dev tool for Angular, really as an extension on the Angular CLI on how to make yourself more productive. Now, I assume that a lot of people here haven't worked with Angular a lot, so Angular is very much oriented towards uh, enterprise. It's used internally in Google in hundreds of apps, so it's really built for scale and for, uh, uh, yeah, large-scale uh, um uh, um, enterprise apps, what I want to say, and uh, then uh, the tooling always has been pretty stellar. Um, like where normal dev tools create React app is useful only when you create the app, and then it stops being useful, and then now you're on your own. Like it provides you in um, in a world where you have to manage your own Webpack config and do all the stuff yourself. And the people on the Angular side, people that learn software development on the Angular side, can go on for years without touching their Webpack config because it basically just works. So uh, leaving all that to the tooling. Uh, and I guess there's something to say for both, right? Um, I, I'm really, um, I've been working a lot of large enterprises for all of my life, so I'm really attracted to the idea everything needs to be hyperscalable. Uh, main experience being like a university with like, I don't know, thousands of students, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of my background. So for me, it's always been very interesting to think about these scaling issues and uh, yeah, NX is a great way to fix this. <clears throat> now over the last, I'd say, so NX has been around for like seven years. I think the last four or five years, they really doubled down on no longer being Angular specific uh, tool. So really adding other frameworks. So, so they started with adding support for nodes. So you could just do like a reg regular TypeScript project, which in turn would allow you to do like Express or, or uh, uh, Nest. APIs or later, uh, what is it, Koa, all that good stuff. Um, and then over the years, they started, uh, they clearly saw that React maint, maintained popularity, even like grow, grew. So they added first class support for React, Next, React Native, uh, all of that stuff. And then since I think six months or something or three months, they officially now also have view support. So that's all pretty good. And they, they're really moving away from being this uh, one one way to do stuff to a more flexible tool so um the way i got to know it, it was a standard mono repo setup where you have like basically a separation between apps and libs so it literally would create an apps folder where you generate your front your your actual app and then in libs you can knock yourself out with with structuring it um but they're going more into free form so it's um if they do now for example support standalone apps if you want to have an app you know it's going to be one app you're not going to break it up into libraries and you want it to be fast and in how you build it and get all the good stuff like linting and testing etc from nx you can build a standalone app it'll basically create a main app but in the root of the project um i, I tried it and then i find myself oh, i actually want to pull certain things out in the lib so i end up with a, a mono repo anyway uh, and they also now start uh, to support something that they call like stand um what is it package based mode which is really um, to fill up where um, basically Lerna leaves you. You have like a folder of packages and you generate a bunch of NPM packages, but you're not necessarily 
building up around it. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> that's kind of a context. Um, feel free to uh, ask questions just during the, the show again or the, the session. Uh, happy to take any questions. What I thought for today and what also was suggested in the channel, we just started up from scratch. Uh, so we're just going to do uh, create Annex workspace. We're going to have like React. Uh, going to set up Tailwind to just have something in terms of UI. Um, and then, yeah, basically see, let's take about take a look at like uh, breaking it up into libraries and like some best practices there. Now, actually, this is not a plug, but just to get an idea, I got like on my YouTube channel, started doing like how to structure Annex repos. I got like to, to three into three episodes. I can talk about this for hours. There's clearly not a solution, not one solution that fits all. The answer is a classic, it depends. Like, yeah, it depends on everything. Like, what are you using? How large is the team? How much uh, apps do you think you create? Um, and in general, I think it's it's good to understand that, like, from my point of view, there's basically two, two types of devs. One type of dev is just a dev that works at some company and they build, they work on their app and this is their app. And then for the next three years, they're gonna work on this workspace in this app. And they hardly create anything new. And then there's the other thing. And I think most people in the, in the Solana ecosystem are more of the second part. You tend to spin up like new projects every now and then, right? I think a lot of people in our ecosystem, they have a new idea. They wanna now quickly start up something and actually get hit the ground running and just um, work on work on some, uh, some new project until it's no longer interesting. Somebody else gets an idea and then you start a new project and then you start building in this one. And I think a lot of people are from the second group. Now, if you're in the first group, you probably don't really care about code uh, structuring because chances are very large you just join a team and you have to follow suit. And maybe at some point you can suggest a change, but this is not something you consider, you're, you're concerned about. Whereas if you build your own stuff every time, it's, it's super important to start thinking about it because um, I know that most devs that work in this way in the fashion that I said, like you build a ton of new apps, like at least every month you do some experiment you do like an, an uh, whatever your favorite framework you do an npx new it you start fiddling around and then might stick might not stick but what you often do is copy over stuff from other apps right so you think like oh, okay i got this wallet adapter config plus i got this like state management that tracks states and i actually want to reuse this because there's doesn't make sense to re-implement it all again uh so you're gonna copy this over Knowing this, you can actually take advantage of this. So you can start building your own libs. And I'm not suggesting that you should build your own libs and push them up to NPM. You might. You might write docs. You might start doing customer support. But actually, just for yourself, having a toolbox that you can carry around is super useful. And uh, one way that, that you can think about it is actually start building your apps in such a manner. It actually helps your future self to just pick up functionality and drop it somewhere else. And this is, I think, the main takeaway when you talk about structuring apps. I think the best way to structure app is thinking about features. And um, anyone that created a new uh, Create Solana dep that uh, Nick and I worked on, um, you can see this idea being around there. So we have an account feature, which is basically your account page. Uh, we have a counter feature, which interacts with the counter program. And now if you want to take it to a different app, you just basically copy the whole counter folder, you drop it somewhere else. You wire up routing and navigation, and, and Bob's your uncle. So uh, this is for me, the best way to think about it, and uh, this is also the thing I see going wrong in most apps, they split files up by type. And then if you have to pick up your functionality into another project, you're now basically picking up the hooks. Let's take React for an example. You pick up hooks there, you pick up the components there, then you pick up the screen, aka your route, and you put it wherever the framework expects you to be. Uh, but it's not easy. And then you have to do a bunch of copy, a uh, bunch of search and replace to rename stuff. All not great. So Annex fixes it by making it very easy, basically cheap, very make, very cheap to make a library. It's great for code splitting. Another benefit it has is that it will um, make building and testing a large app actually faster. So instead of rebuilding the same app, if Kudo and I are on the same team and we pull from the same repo, whatever you push up to the build cache, I'll, I'll uh, leverage whenever I do a build. So the idea is Monday morning, the person that comes first into the office builds all the stuff, pushes into the cache, but the person that comes in after that just pull it into the cache and run it. Now, if you have like a small front end app, your classical Solana app doesn't need it, but there's apps with like vast amounts of libraries. I've worked on projects where there are like 500 libraries or a thousand libraries 
like where you have like three different teams committing to the same code, then each team might have like, I don't know, between eight or 15 devs. This is pretty huge and these benefits, they add up. And uh, this adds up locally for every dev. This adds up into CI. Uh, so when, once you run the code onto CI, it will only test the code that you changed. And uh, this, these are things that are huge wins. I think well worth investing a bit of time uh, getting to know these tools and actually use them as standards and um, serve me very well. And uh, yeah, I used to work as consultant. I'll, I'll, I'll get to the good stuff in a bit, but just some context. I used to work as a consultant, migrated a bunch of uh, people to NX. Most people really like it, um, even though it's a bit um, overwhelming up front. It's not a, it's not a low code solution. There's a lot of files and uh, you have to learn what to look at. So. Yeah, I guess that's a bit of a preface for today, and um, let's get started. So, um, I like to use uh, PNPM. You can use whatever, but uh, using PNPM here, and then uh, let's do it like this. So, the, what I do here is do the create NX workspace command, taking the latest, and I pass in the name of the workspace, which is the name of the directory that I will create. It's also the name of the NPM scope that we'll use throughout throughout the app. So we're gonna be, uh, I'm gonna be c uh, creating a new empty uh, workspace here. So we're gonna build it from scratch. If you wanna start quickly, you can just clearly take one of the presets and go this way, but we'll build from scratch. Cool. Uh, here it asks what type of thing. So this is a standalone app that I mentioned, just one app. This is the, the package-based monorepo if you just wanna push out packages. What we really want here is the integrated monorepo where we have an app. Uh, we basically split it up in multiple projects. Uh, yeah, let's do NX caching. Quick question there. If you click packages, is it too late to go back? Is it super different? No, it's so it going back to standalone is, is hard because standalone is like really a subset of the larger thing. In fact, okay. when you're standalone and you and you create a library, it'll now basically pop you into in a monorepo mode. Uh, doing the rest integrated, I think the main difference is the the first option you saw there, uh, the package-based repo, allows for multiple package JSONs across the board, multiple versions. And this is something we chatted about in the in the channel, but um, I think there's a lot of merits having single version policy, which means in my mono repo there's only one version of Solana Web 3GS and one version of Solana SPL token. Uh, so yeah. That's the main difference. You can have different, um, like really isolated packages. Okay. Uh, so we're popping into this and then I'm opening uh, WebStorm here. Uh, Summer said, will you cover migration briefly? Migration to NX. So my, um, yeah, to NX. So, okay, my, my, opinion on this is I think migrations are best done um, starting a new app and moving stuff over. I don't really believe in going to like your create react, what is it, create react app project and run like NX migrate, even though they provide this option. They'll figure out how this thing is built and they put it into a new workspace. Uh, I worked actually on a lot of migration projects and generally the advice is just start a new project, move stuff over and then uh, start splitting out and take it actually as an opportunity to revise your app and to figure out like, hey, what is stuff that we actually want to change? What's been stuff that's been itching us for years and uh, that we still want to do? Uh, I actually see Sol Andy here. This is really great. I'm uh, like, uh, he's one of my favorite uh, YouTube teachers. GM cool. Sol Andy. Also Dan, Dan is here as well. And Bagia, oh man, bunch of friends here. I'm not going to name you all, but uh, this, this is awesome. Uh, so yeah, we spun up, actually, uh, if you have questions about uh, NX, uh, you can also ask uh, Dan. He's been on NX also for ages. He's like, uh, I don't know, he r surely runs into the five years uh, of NX usage. Um, so cool. So what we started here is just an empty, empty project, nothing out of the ordinary. It's your package JSON. Uh, this is the NX JSON. NX used to have like a huge, huge workspace JSON in the root of it, and they moved away from this. So they really start like... Um, making their footprint smaller. This NX JSON has some things on how it builds, uh, how it does caching, etc. You generally don't really need to touch this, uh, but it does need to be there. Although I think, I'm not sure, I have to test it. 
it, it now works. If you really don't like this file, you can actually put it into package.json under an NX keyword here and just start uh, defining it like so. I don't know, uh, just something here. But it, this gives us basically our workspace. And now the idea is that you create different projects in this workspace. So we can check briefly what we can create by running NX, NX list. Now, NX list will actually give you a, an overview of the plugins you got installed. So we start with an empty workspace. So it basically st installs a workspace generator. We can do some basic JS stuff. Uh, but here's where the actual frameworks come in. So you have like Angular, Expo, Nest and Next, Plain Node. And for the, for the idea, we're going to start with React here. So I'm going to uh, install React. And uh, once that's installed, you can actually use the same list command to see what this what this functionality brings you. Um, and this is something that I think is super powerful because as said, these generators and this, this tool set keeps on being useful after being after you create it. So um, in a second, we'll be creating, for instance, an application here. But afterwards, we're going to create libraries. And if you want to go a step further, you can even have it create components for you or pieces like slices of state hmm. and uh, storybook configurations, etc. You can have it create hooks, etc., etc., etc. And uh, now one common question is like, yeah, but I can just go in and create the file, which is totally true. Uh, you can and you, you still can. But if you work on a large team, you probably don't want to just create the file. You want to create the file. You generally want to create a test if you're serious about this kind of stuff. If you're an enterprise, you have to get have like tests. You want to have this file according to a few names. So you only allow certain things to be in the file name and all more of this stuff. And with these generators, you can actually build your own and uh, link all of these. So what you can do and what I what I do, I never start a project from scratch, scratch. I got a bunch of generators all all wired up together. And all of these chained up, I just give one command and it'll ge it'll generate like tree libraries and a bunch of services and components, etc. And all like permutated with the name I pass in. So if it's post, it'll do like post feature. If it's like company, it'll do company feature, etc., etc. So yeah, these generators are super powerful. Um, the ones that are crucial, uh, the things you don't want to do yourself is application or library. All of the rest, like components and stuff, I I don't I tend to not use them, but it's there and it's very useful if you're working on a team. So just uh, as an FYI, check these ones. This one's super useful, for instance, set up Tailwind. Like, mm -hmm. sure, Tailwind's easy, like three files and a few dependencies. Oh, and you have to do like this small update. And then for an exit, it's a bit different here. It's just one command, forget about it. It's like five seconds, literally, and then it just works. So um, yeah, using, using generators uh, is uh, definitely uh, advised. Uh, we're going to create an app. I like to call these things web. Uh, if it's just a web app, I like descriptive short names. I would never call it React. If you want to call it the name of your framework, you can. I'd say it's an app is called a uh, front end. It's called web. It's called admin. It's called site. If you're building like a public website, my APIs are always called API. You can call them John if you want, but I like like sh short and sweet and descriptive. A yeah, quick question there. Um, I hadn't been yeah. supplying the directory flag when playing with this. I think if you just do web, it'll just put it in a web folder and call it package web. Is that what happens? Yeah, okay. correct. Yeah, this is actually moving away from NX being very, um, uh, what is it, opinionated about these things to being more like loose end. Like you'll do it whatever you, you have to do it and then you have to specify it. It used to be, um, it used to be so that you have like these folders defined in your NXJSON. So in NXJSON, you would say, hey, my apps all go into apps, my libs all go into libs. They're moving away from this configuration. Uh, it asks us if we want to do the router. Yes, sure. So end-to-end -end tests, um, for the example, I'm going to say no, but you can have it create a whole Cypress setup or Playwright setup and actually do end-to-end -end tests for your front end. Um, in this case, we'll use Vite, uh, not really. And this, it'll ask it here, is it as provided or is it a derived address? It used to be only derived. And now it's it has you have to provide it. Uh, this is as of uh, NX uh, 18, the next major version, which should be there in like April. Uh, this will be the default as provided. So I'm trying to already move that way. 
and X tends to do two releases a year, so very consistent, and uh, this is really great. Uh, it's really in line with um, Angular, who does the same. It's not fixed anymore, but it's very much the same, and it has the same version. And the reason why this is great, you can basically postpone your updates to either once or twice per year if you want. And this, again, for large companies, this is huge, right? Because we can just do an update in the, in the weekend and be, be good with it. But if you're a large organization, it might take you a month, in all honesty. And uh, it's really good to know, like, okay, they launch in May and November. So in June and December, I just dedicate some time to do the updates so that my depths are all done and then uh, keep up to date. Uh, so yeah, uh, this this has been done and it generated our app here. Now this is uh, very much uh, how an app looks like in uh, like a normal Vite app. If like your public folder, your app, your main TSX, no surprises here. Uh, and then this project JSON, this is very NX specific. This is where you um, actually define what you can do with this library. So you can build the app, you can just run it here. I got the an extension installed. Um, so I get all of these handy uh, play buttons. I can just do stuff. But yeah, I can just uh, cool. build your app and what it will do, it'll load its executor, which will actually do all the build magic. So this is very NX specific. NX has their very opinionated uh, Vite build setup. Most of these things these days you can actually override. So here in options, you could say, oh, I got a, I got a custom config file, use this one if you want to do fancy stuff. What we're interested about here is running the server. So this is what you'd normally do like, hey, NX dev, um, uh, yeah, basically uh, yarn dev starting. This is one of these things. I'm just gonna add it as a small tip here. You probably wanna go into package.json, add a run script here and say, hey, dev is, uh, what is it? NX serve web. This is what you actually serve. Or you can be more specific, hey, NX, uh, run the following in the project web, run the serve command. This is what it technically does. And then and you can... Uh, web maps to the project name, right? Exactly. In the yeah, JSON. Exactly. Yeah. 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 This is uh, this word right here. Correct. Yeah. So in apps web JSON, the name is web. Now, another thing to note, what I, what I tend to say to uh, a lot of junior devs that are super overwhelmed by structure like this, I'm generally telling them, hey, every, everything inside source is whatever you have to worry about. Everything outside of source, just look look at it as if it's your software development kit. Like, that's the way how I see it. You don't touch these files generally. You might tweak something. You might add a custom, like, ESLint rule, or you might add some other fancy thing in your project, because, or uh, let's say, change your port. If you want to have your web server on port 3000, you'll just pop it in here. But generally, you don't develop in these things. Uh, so yeah, this is that, and then here we got the website running, nothing too fancy here. Let's look at our AppTSX, and uh, well, here it does a bunch of stuff. We can get rid of the styles, we won't use it. We can actually get rid of this welcome screen here as well. Uh, just do it like this, it's just basic React app with uh, a routing setup. And uh, let's actually set up Tailwind, so we're gonna do this uh, we're going to run this um, generator that sets up Tailwind uh, for a project. I'm not sure why my keyboard's not working, but luckily I got a backup. Uh, and as you see, what it does is it wants to create our, it creates our post CSS, our Tailwind config, and updates our app CSS. Plus, it installs some dependencies, just the stuff you do normally, but it saves you from going. <clears throat> It saves you from going back to the to the documentation to figure out. So yeah, it got like auto prefixer for us, uh, post CSS tailwind, which is what you normally do, out of the box. Uh, so yeah, with that here, I think we should be on tailwind right now. If we refresh this thing, yeah, fonts are changed. Yes. I can go back, and then let's actually quickly go into style CSS. So here you see it updated it. Not sure why my editor is not happy about it, but. Uh, uh, let's do two small things. So in order to not get blind, let's say dark mode, let's set it to class. Let's go to index HTML, set class here to dark. And let's go into the uh, style CSS. Uh, what are we doing to do here? Say dark 
them. I guess Tailwind knows what I want. Yeah, there you go. Awesome. Uh, so that's it. Let's actually make a quick uh, commit. <clears throat> NX already does a commit, so first commit is basically my changes, creating the app. Um, yeah, I'm not sure there if there are questions. Scooter, are you, are you going to ping me because the screen is there? I'm super happy to answer anything, but... Um, do you want me to interrupt questions as they come, or do you like questions at the end? We had one... Yeah, let's... let's... Okay, we had one that had to do with multiple ENVs. Yeah. Uh, I personally use T3 ENV. I need to figure out what T3 ENV is, though I have not heard of it. Uh, is this... Uh, Bagia, is this about... Um, uh, let's see. ENV files? ENV vars. Okay, yeah, this this is um, an interesting thing. I have not heard of ENV files. So, in the current project I'm in, which is um, a React web app, I think you can add just a .env here, and it'll be parsed. Uh, there's not something for management of the ENV, at least not that I'm aware of. And this is, in general, interesting to... Um, to kind of get an understanding of what things NX concerns about and what things it doesn't, because uh, some people might expect it to be opinionated. And they tend to be very cautious with things that tend to be very opinionated. An example of this, a classic example, one of the things where NX used to leave you totally in the blind, in the blind was doing a release. So you would say, and they added this uh, like a few months ago, like four months back, they added finally an NX release where it actually takes your package, builds it, pops it up to NPM which is a very common use case, but they never did it because it's a um, very uh, opinionated process and it's very customized for each company. So, yeah. Um, so let's say we have this, uh, this basic web app now and then, um, I can actually get rid of this file. Oh, can we take a question real quick? Yeah, for sure. Bug, yeah. Hey there, sir. GM, GM, everybody. GM, good to see you, man. Yeah, actually, uh, I have been using this T3 ENV because sometimes what happens is that we forget, uh, like our project is using a particular ENV variable, but we forget to add it in ENV local and we forget it to add on Vercel, let's say. Like we had worked on it uh, in local, but we forgot to add that in the Vercel and then our build is crashing. And we don't know why, uh, like build doesn't crashes. And in the runtime, because the variable is undefined, we are having issues. So with T3 and we, what happens is during the build time, it checks that uh, all the env defined in that file is present in the dot env dot local, or uh, the envs are present that are defined in the file. So that way, if you miss to add env variable in like Vercel or anywhere, uh, it will throw an error during the build time. So your build will not process and you will not have a runtime problem. So using T3 NV, what I am personally facing is that uh, because these services, utils, wherever I am using these ENV, these are being uh, used by both uh, API uh, app and web app. And the API app has different ENVs and web app has different ENVs. So what happening is uh, they don't know that I am not using web, web, web ENV in API but because these services are using it and all the uh, files are being imported to API when I am uh, importing the service package, right? So that's why I'm facing this uh, issue. What I have to do it to resolve is, uh, it is that having uh, those web ENVs also present in the API ENV file to resolve that for now. But I think that uh, if I will not use T3 ENV, then there's no issue. But I really want to use this T3 ENV so, uh, so that we don't have this uh, build uh, problem that I just mentioned at the start. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, enlightening it. I did. I don't know about it. I think it it looks definitely interesting. I uh, I clearly ran into this issue of similar things. So one thing, kind of being advocate of the devil here, you should have a CI process that actually runs before you deploy. So saying that this breaks deployments is not an excuse. It's just an indication that you don't have your process set up well. You should not deploy something before it fails the test that actually proves this. 
But this is just, I mean, it's a little, I, I understand this is not the quick change. It's also not set the, the one you want to hear, but it is, it's the, the thing that actually fixes the root issue, right? You should not deploy stuff before you catch these errors. This is one of them. Uh, like, yeah, E and V files is a very common thing. Like, you made a change locally, you didn't do it. Other thing is like database import. You build a new feature, it depends on some data being on the database. This is what you should catch. So that, that being said, fixing the actual problem at hand, like the first idea that I have is say, uh, let's maybe the solution is creating a shared library that's doing only environment stuff, where then both apps depend on. So you can say it's good in the library, and then you do these two apps point to this library, uh, and this will work. Another very common thing they do this for is um, classes and type definitions, etc. These are things you classically want to use in both in both parts of your app or any part of the app that you have. So it makes a ton of sense to have a, um, a library for these things. I think uh, last thing actually, I have created one package for ENV, like for okay. storing my ENV and managing this. But uh, the issue is that these ENVs are uh, imported. Uh, so, so when you will uh, build this, you will create like a, a API ENV and like a front end ENV, both yeah. different uh, the, uh, these uh, structures so that you can verify those. But when you will uh, export both in a service package, let's say, and that service package is being uh, imported in API, so it will demand you uh, both the uh, ENVs. Uh, but it because all the files are being imported, right? So yeah. that's the problem. I think I'm more than happy to look at it uh, in more detail. But yeah, it's things like this where you have to figure out uh, a way how to look, how to work with it. Uh, another example, for instance, ShadCN. I really like what I see there. Uh, for me, it beats writing my own Tailwind. But then I look, ShadCN doesn't work out of the box because it expects a, ne a, next, uh, a next project. Um, so yeah, things. I'm. Um, uh, I, I don't think we'll we'll manage to fix it right now. Let's uh, at some point, uh, Bagya, look at the specific issue. I'm uh, more than happy to help you find a, a solution. Yeah, let's have a, another show and tell for ENV management or something. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Sure. That's, Thank that's, you. Uh, that's a great right, thanks one. for bringing it Cheers. up. Cheers. Um, yeah, and then okay, this is my basic app. Nothing out of the ordinary here. It uh, gets tested, but um, yeah, I'm. I'm not very huge on front-end testing, uh, but I work, worked with a, quite a bunch of clients where it's just inexcusable to not have front-end tests. So it's great that this tool sets it up for you and uh, it makes it easy to run. Uh, so yeah, you can do just NX test web and uh, it'll run just over your, um, it'll run just over your test. And because I removed this, uh, this component here, uh, test fails, uh, which should be a fairly, uh, easy fix if we just say it's called home but I think this is uh, the fix but yeah as said I'm uh, especially for the types of apps that I'm mostly working on I'm not super huge on front-end testing but it's cool that it's there now let's talk about splitting up stuff so the way I like to see this is that my app in an NX workspace is basically just an entry point to start serving a module and then from there on I go nuts inside libraries. So what I do generally in front end world is I create a so called shell, which is just your UI shell or your Chrome is another way to look at it. But shell is a pretty common name. Uh, and this is where my router lives and this is where my actual routes uh, are defined. And then all of the routes are features, as we discussed earlier, and all of these features tend to live in their own library. Uh, so my app is something I hardly touch. I'm using setup global styles, just as I did here. I generally do like, oh yeah, it needs to be all full height so I can do uh, build like full screen apps. So let's say this one, yeah, height 100. Um, this is needed for Tailwind. And then other than that, I don't really touch this. And then what my, actually, my, what my actual app renders here is basically my shell. I, I mean, we can kind of build the idea here so I can say, hey, uh, let's call this thing my shell. Um, and then, I mean, nothing out of the ordinary here. And then my idea is, okay, let's move shell to a library. So we got this one pulled out. And then clearly you can say, okay, why even have this app components? Well, yeah, you can just, of course, 
do it directly where you initialize your app, right? There's no difference here. So we can now just take our uh, shell components and move it into its own library, and uh, that should all be good. So let's actually do that. So we're going to use this nx uh, generate command again and say nx lib, uh, nx react lib. And I'm going to call it shell. And again, I'm going to pass in my directory, uh, which is a directory libs shell. Uh, I'm going to dry run it just to see what it asks me. It asks me for the unit test runner. I'm not going to do unit tests for the moment. It asks me how to build these things. going to go to beat. Yes, and the provided stuff. So let's actually run this. Uh, I'm going to go feed. We actually don't need a, bu a bundler for this library because we're not going to build it separately. This this library is just going to be included by our app. There's no need to build it separately. So we're going to skip the whole build step. We're going to do this as provided stuff uh, because that's where we're at. And now inside here, it created a new structure. So yeah, a bunch of files again. Uh, ignore it, it's your SDK. You should not worry about these files. Uh, you can just assume they don't exist. But initially it'll be, um, you have to get used to this stuff a bit. Uh, and there it is, it's our shell module. So um, let's take this content that we have here from our, um, from our app. Let's whack it in here. We can get rid of the defaults, we can get rid of the styles. And um, I think that's about it for now. And that means that instead of uh, importing this thing from here, we actually delete all of our app here. We no longer need that. Then we'll see that it will be imported from the 76 dev slash shell. Cool. So now there's one thing. If you generate a package, <coughs> it'll actually be registered here, here in your TS config, all in the top of your project, down here on line 18. Now, this is the reason that you have to restart your dev server. So my dev server right now doesn't understand it. The error says fail to import, fail to resolve import 76 dev slash shell. I have to reinitialize it to pick up config. I really hope TypeScript fixes this at some point, but for now this is um, this is how it works. Now, this being said, this is my preferred way. Um, I'm not very bullish on projects that use file system routing, but they're all over the place. They're super popular. I did a vote. I think 75% love it, uh, which, I mean, yeah. I must be stupid, but whatever. Uh, if you do file system-based routing, this is clearly different because you cannot just tell um, Next to look at your files in another place. It's one of the reasons I think it just sucks. It's just like wacky because now you have to keep like one main structure, basically the whole, um, the whole map of your site, you have to keep it in one place. This is not at all portable. Uh, and besides that, there's there's zero benefit in putting it in file name. <clears throat> I really see it like they're abusing file names and, and all of its limitations to actually express important stuff like dependencies, what's the layout of what, what needs to go where. It goes against reusability. There's a ton of stuff against it. And, and, and um, it, there's nothing that it delivers that you cannot do by defining your routes in code. There, a few months ago, Dev, Dev told me like, ah, oh, you can't do server-side rendering when you have file-based routing. That's nonsense. There's no zero reason these things are mapped. Other than that, NX made this mapping, but uh, server-side rendering for single-page apps has been a thing way before Next existed, and it worked without file system routing. So uh, please reconsider this next time you're doing it and you're fighting against if it's with brackets or square brackets or three dots or five dots or whatever dot your file, file, file name, no, there's better solutions. It's called code. Anyway, based uh, uh, um, bearish me, but the rest of the world is, uh, is, is bullish or whatever. But yeah, we cleaned up our app. And now if we do a uh, commit here, then uh, we will not touch it uh, for the rest of the session. OK, so yeah, we won something here. This is not huge. Um, we, we literally moved something somewhere else. So. Add shell components. I'll do a quick commit here. Uh, it's a library, actually. Uh, but let's see if we can take it a bit further. So one of the things that you generally want to sp uh, split up between apps. So shells tend to be very app specific because this is where your routing lives. Um, and then uh, I even like to go as far as say, hey, actually my routing is in my whole file itself. So I say uh, shell routes. Let's call it like this and uh, 
get rid of these files here and just say, okay, we're going to pop like shell routes in here. Uh, shell routes live here and then uh, pop it into his own file. Make sure it has a, a proper file name. And uh, and then you can be good. But I think like, yeah, this is just structuring an app. There's, uh, there's little rocket science here. Let's now take a look at adding something um, uh, something else. What is happening here? Come on. Yeah. Uh, let's actually do something that's really useful because shell is to be, is very app specific. It has routing, it has your navigation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But something that's often shared, first thing that's often shared is UI. Uh, so let's actually take this. Uh, lips shell command and do it like lips UI create that one and then I already typed it before this is just to stop it from asking any questions it's this is just now my way to create new lips so start working on your shortcuts um, and be prepared to have some ready to copy paste stuff because you will re reuse it a lot and now if you share it with the team talk to me again I'll do a show and tell on how to build like your own uh, plugin to to, to easily repeat the stuff. Um, but yeah, we can already think about and then uh, just we can go go about what we want to do, but we can create a simple notepad or maybe a counter, uh, whatever we want to do. But yeah, I created my uh, UI library. And then actually now, now we can just for the sake of it, uh, do the generation of a component. So we create a React component. It'll actually pull up pull up this UI. This is super useful for uh, beginner folk, right? If you have like a, a junior on the team, please explain them how to use this. Let them actually explore how to use this if you don't know it, uh, because this is uh, this is really something that makes it easy. I'm not sure why this UI is, so, but let's create a UI layout. Now, one of the things that I really like about it, it has this dry run. It keeps on dry running it. So while you're configuring the thing you you want to build, That's cool. you actually see what the result is. So we know it, it adds a spec file, but we already decided like we're not going to do tests in this project right now. So we're just going to not have a, a test runner here. I need to figure out where this is, but you can disable test runner and it will not create your tests, which is great. And then um, I think it's a matter of not picking, um, not picking a test in source tests. You can even do JS if you want to torture yourself. You can just do TS, go do it. Um, flat file, Pascal case, project name. I'm not exactly what component it is, but one of the things that what I like about this, it'll actually show you the commands that you need to run to generate this. So you don't have to keep on using the, AI, uh, the, the, the UI for the rest of your life. Once you get like this nice way how to generate all of your packages, you copy the commands, you just go back to the terminal um, and um, and you start running the command itself, right? And that that's something that I really like. Okay, now it asked me directory again. Uh, we need to get over with this directory stuff. Uh, yeah, generate stuff here. Uh, so yeah, I got a, a, a generated command and it's all wired up, it's all tested, and now we should be able to call like UI layout here. There you go. And then put my routes, my shell inside, my routes inside the layout, and that's it. And then the only thing I have to do is like change my, my layout. I need to export it here. So if you generate something, you need to export it. Uh, and we'll get in the topic of this exporting in a second. Uh, but this works here for now. It will re-import it from the right place. There you go. Um, and that's it. And now we can add like uh, our children here. Just some normal React stuff. We can get rid of the styles because we're not going to theme this, uh, this baby. Uh, we can just prop some children. And then this is your header, your footer. Then I guess this is going to be your main. There you are. Now we have a layout file. Also, it adds default exports. You should not use default exports. Just use normal exports. 
Uh, doing some small cleanup here, but yeah, the, the whole idea is we now got a layout file. I need to figure out. Okay, and again, I need to restart my dev server because I create a new package, and otherwise it doesn't understand it. But yeah, header and footer here, page one, page two, still that routing wired up. It doesn't look like much, but we do have a pretty clean structure uh, already, um, especially if you do some more uh, cleanup. But uh, if you have a dev joining your your uh, your program, you can tell them to start looking at the shell of the project and from here work its way into all of the features. So open your shell, open your routes, and now you can see what your app actually does. Um, and then another benefit of using a structure like this, go to any other project that's built with the same structure and you will, you'll be familiarized. I think one of the biggest critics against React and the whole ecosystem for people coming from the Angular work, world, it's like it's loose sense because you have to basically relearn every app how it's built. You have to understand what the developer was thinking in terms of naming, in terms of structure, etc. So having a, a um, having a set structure for these things really helps uh, getting up to speed uh, with other stuff. So yeah, we created this thing, and now we're we're in two main libraries. Still didn't really really add any um, functionality, but we can already do some fun stuff. And one of the things that I think is uh, interesting is this NX graph. Um, I'm going to pull it over here. And what this actually does, it uses the information that's in the in the mono repo uh, to create a graph about dependency of your app. So you can uh, see that the web uh, application depends on the shell, which depends in turn on the UI. Wow. And now if you start adding routes, so we can add like a... Um, Let's add a notes feature and say, so we do React Lib and actually start adding some features. So let's say a notes feature, and I'm going to put this into libs slash features slash notes to at least have some sort of hierarchy because it's getting pretty flat. And if we add a bunch of features, I'd love them to be all in the same structure. Now, this is not exactly how I would do it right now, but for the sake of the demo, we can totally have like an imaginary uh, app where we're taking notes and we're building stuff about the company. And maybe we also want to um, work with like registering materials, whatever, just for the sake of it. These are basically in a lot of enterprise apps, you'll talk about domains. Like you have the library, the, the company domain where everything happens about the company. You have like the material domain the notes department, something like this. So these are, are all their own things. Now we can actually wire this up. So let's quickly implement a number of routes and a small navigation section here. So actually I like my routes um, defined in code as I, I, as I mentioned. So you can actually, for those that are not aware, you can use the use routes hook from um, React Router DOM. And then we have our Notes component here. I think it's called Notes. Yep, it's called Notes. Let's actually call it Notes Feature. Um, and install the Notes Feature. So we'll have this live under the Notes uh, library. Uh, we do another one for company. And another one for material at the route here, companies. Like so. And you see this all just works as expected. It all understands like these this mapping. Uh, and now you can just say return routes. And then okay, if it's this simple, we might as well just return the hook directly. Currently, that works as well. This is all valid. React, uh, call this feature. Call this one feature as well. Now, in a real app, I would do lazy loading, which is yeah another topic we can uh, spend time on. But sure, this this just works as expected. And then, if we go back to our app, uh, it again it needs to restart the dev server because we created libraries. Uh, and then I actually don't have navigation in here. So let me quickly pop in um, 
uh, what is it? We just no, we're just gonna use the link from React Router DOM. Exactly. Oh, this is such a godsend. <laughs> uh, and lo and behold, this all works as expected. So yeah, nothing really out of the ordinary here. I think one of the uh, great things is it should get out of the way fairly quickly. Uh, shouldn't have to worry about it too much after getting um, uh, after getting your feet wet. And that's the whole idea, right? This tool is built to make you more productive and make you more consistent. Uh, and faster in building code. And it's not, the goal is not to be using an X a whole lot. Um, if you, I think if you do it well, you end up not actually using it. It just powers a bunch of things that you do, mainly your custom generators, your building, your linting, et cetera, et cetera, because that's what, what, uh, what's wasting a lot of time. Other than that, yeah, you're just building your app, thinking about these things, separation. Now let's go back to this uh, graph again. So I'm not sure if this auto refreshes, it might. Oh, I think this just needs to run the graph one more time. Uh, but yeah, now it understands, hey, these projects are here as well. It's because of the hierarchy I put in here, it actually understands, oh, you're talking about features here. This is super useful because like, if you are in, you would normally not divide this by features and core th stuff. You'd say, I have section four company, I have section four materials. It's like basically based on department. It's super nice if people can just work in their own world without being bothered by the rest of the world uh, that happens to live in the same repo. Uh, so now we can see Shell depends on UI, uh, but Shell also depends on company, material, and nodes because of their routes. Uh, this is all inferred by TypeScript, by the way. There's little magic here. Uh, it's really just interpreting the, the, the file system, the project itself. Um, and then in... A very common thing to do was actually is actually to build out more UI features. So let's say you now want to have your, your UI button uh, that's uh, doing your uh, yeah that's implementing your own custom button the way you want it, whatever that is. Then um, yeah, you export it here. And then you import it inside your features. Uh, let's do it here. Let's do UI button. Great. Let's also do it in material and let's do not do it in notes. There you go. And then I think I imagine a refresh here. It does need to restart this graph. Uh, I personally find myself not using the graph too often because if you if you use this for a while your mental map is is solid about this thing uh, but yeah what you can now see is that all of these things also depend on material so material depends on ui let's actually get rid of this shell so we can see what's happening here uh, it can be a bit messy but i guess the whole idea is that you can actually visualize things and um like let's say if it really gets messy, you just exclude one from the view. Getting an idea around this, it really helps me if I'm debugging circular dependencies. That's the most mm -hmm. uh, one. Something imports from something else, and sh it should not do this. Uh, and then on that note, one of the things that's really powerful if you build large apps, you can actually add tags to your projects here. So your project JSON is the definition of your project in the workspace. This is all of the apps or libraries. They at least have this project JSON that tells like, okay, this is the functionality it has. But what it also allows you to do, oh, here it is, is add tags. Now, I don't know if I had the, the, the actual syntax of the rules, but what it allows you to do, well, actually, okay, it already says, hey, the scope here is company. So it understands this type of libraries feature. Now, this is great because you can set up linting rules by extending, uh, by just instructing, re reutilizing uh, rules that an X already has. And you can define rules and say, hey, features can never import from each other. Or a data access layer can always import from each other, but a data access layer can never import from something that's a UI lib. It wouldn't logically make sense. If your data access layer have to, has to import from your UI lib, it's in the wrong place. You either need a separate library or you just need to move the, the thing 
uh, but this is not something that logically makes sense. This is not something that you'd ever want to do, even though, of course, it can. It's like I can put my blender in the bathroom. It doesn't make any logical sense. I'd use it there. So, so you can prevent these kind of things from happening, even though you can clearly create a, a button component wherever the hell you like. Uh, again, a lot of nice things for large apps. And then I think um, one thing that I like to, to show is now I can do my build of my app. Uh, so I'd say NX build web. Who doesn't like a fresh milkshake when taking a bath? You're right, Choco Panda. That's that's valid. Uh, now we 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 saw the build. It took like I don't know, maybe five seconds, and then if you run it again, it's instant. And uh, this is where NX really shines, and uh, it's 0 0.3 seconds, 0 0.2 seconds. Um, NX is blazingly fast because of its cache, and it's fast. Like here you go, thumbs up for NX. Uh, it's fast on this system. But if I go to like, I don't know, Pupki, my latest Pupki project I'm working on, if I say NX build web here, um, it's doing a bunch of stuff as well. It initially takes longer because it has to build. But second one is as fast because it caches all of it. Doesn't matter if it caches uh, five, um, five projects or 50 projects or 500 projects. This all works super well. So now second time, bam, it's there instantly again. Uh, and this is because of advanced caching of all of these separate parts. So think about 0.3 second things like this, web building, linting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and one of the interesting, one of the interesting, I guess, funny things is that once uh, Turbo Build came out, they announced like, oh yeah, Turbo Build's new things build on Rust and it's faster than NX. And then Victor guy, like the tech. Uh, the, the, the giga brain behind NX, he kind of took it. He didn't take it as an insult. He's uh, like very uh, engineering mindset, so he was like, "Let's let's measure," and uh, he started optimizing for speed. And because he never had any serious competition, Lerna has been around. But Lerna was like, "Yeah, it's the thing from the past. Nobody really gave gave a damn." Uh, so they didn't have any serious competition. But and then because of uh, the claim that. Uh, I guess Jared Palmer is the guy who wrote Turbo Repo. He claimed like, oh, it's faster than NX. And Victor actually made a, a comparison repo. It's like, well, I'm testing this. It's not faster. It's actually NX is faster. Uh, hmm. But the funny thing is he actually started obsessing about performance and he, he found a bunch of stuff that you could uh, <laughs> squeeze out in terms of optimization because, yeah, if you don't really focus on it, you're not really, it's not an objective, but they started really focusing, doubling down on the speed. So the fact that Turbo Repo came around make NS, made NX even better in the sense that it's now way faster. And uh, it's also lowering the footprint. This this graph stuff and a lot of these commands are actually powered by Daemon that runs on your system. It knows everything about your repo. It's written in Rust for performance reasons. And uh, so they're moving parts of their tool chain to Rust uh, as well, thanks to um, Turbo Repo being there. Uh, I'd love somebody cool. to do a, a t show and tell on Turbo Repo, by the way. I've not worked with it. I I worked, I worked. pulled in repos from GitHub that used it. I saw it in action. I never really built with it. Love to hear what it's about. Ideally, from somebody that used both, that they can just like basically pinpoint a comparison and then... Um, yeah, that'd be great. Nice thing. I'm pretty service level with Turbo. Just use it at work, but I haven't set something up with it. With the... Um, with the caching stuff, is that all stored locally and like stored in your Git history? Because I saw some thing about NX Cloud, but that's probably not with caching. Yeah. So NX Cloud is remote caching, and okay. uh, this is this is uh, where their commercial offering starts. So what you've seen right here, it's all free and open source, MIT license. You can use it in any project, and then if you generate a new project, it'll actually ask. Do you want fast CI builds? And what they do, they generate an NX access token for you. And this is NX Cloud. And uh, NX Cloud is basically a, um, it's a shared storage of cache items. That's the most, um, I guess, simplest way to put it. Probably not doing it justice for everything it really can. Uh, but let me see, just pulling it up here, uh, other browser. Sorry for the widescreen. Um, but here it is where you put in your repos. So you create an organization, you connect it up to your workspace, which is one-on-one -on -one to your GitHub or GitLab or other providers. Uh, and then let's see Solana Wallet Adapter, for instance, uh, something where actually RAM builds PubKey, I assume. 
Fuck yeah, not at this one. Fuck you, this should have a few. There you go. Uh, yeah, so it basically keeps track of uh, CI runs that I did. Uh, so stuff on CI, and it tends to give a bit more information. So like, interesting ones are not the ones that succeed. The failed ones are interesting. Uh, so you can see stuff here. It'll actually give the error. Um, I hardly see myself visiting this site. I um, do leverage it because it, the cache is sweet. It's on a per repo basis, which is interesting. And every repo is like 500 hours of compute to to do. So they tend to count their the leverage of using an X. They tend to count it in dev dev hours saved, like mm -hmm. the, whatever amount of time you save on CI by using an X versus previous. This is what they think is the measurement of uh, successful next usage, which is an interesting one. Uh, I I had projects go back from like 30 minutes, 40 minutes to like five, and this is huge. I mean, you don't want to you don't want to see how happy the project manager or CTO on the team is if you manage to bring something to the table like this. Uh, I think only possible on Solana. It's like only possible with NX, these kind of <laughs> things. There's now other tools as well, right? It's, it's, it's clearly not uh, do you have for OPI. Do you have to opt in for remote caching to use caching? No. Okay, okay. It, it'll do it'll do cache locally. And besides that, there's clearly a bunch of companies that don't allow you to uh, or whatever outside of the company That's just what connect I was to server and, yeah and uh, i think uh, there's an open source nx cloud uh, implementation oh cool uh, on premise you can run it on premise if you're paying customers so you can just like uh, get a plan with them um, now, can as... i interject something real quick uh, GM, GM. Uh... Yeah. On the topic of uh, caching, that's one argument. I don't think you covered this, but my kids have been distracting me. Uh, that's one argument to use PNPM. It has a really good uh, caching strategy um, for like local collab, and I think it has a remote support as well. I never considered remote support for PNPM, but I do love its local store. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I love PNPM. But yeah, this is the NX Cloud. And one of the things that I like about NX, I mean, I'm clearly biased. You've seen, I've, I've been along this. Uh, among these uh, this project since literally day one. I'm a huge fan and advocate. One of the things I personally really like about the guys, they're guys like us, uh, fans about open source. They want to just build cool shit. And they support people like this building a community edition. They're not the type of company that's like, oh yeah, let's make it difficult for somebody to integrate. They actually opened up parts of the API and made it easier for people to, to work with these things. And this is what I, th what I really appreciate. Also, uh, having used it, I've never had even one client that had to pay for the NX caching plan. So I generally tell these people, like, yeah, we're going to leverage this cache. It's going to save us a bunch of time. Code's going to be out there. If that's not an issue, let's do it. And then at some point, you'll have to pay. I yet have to, f well, I, I'm not in touch with most of these clients, honestly, but I've never came across like, oh, you actually have to cough up. Um, because 500 compute hours is a lot. I think there's 700 hours in a week. So you can almost run an entire week of CI in a month. That's You need to do a lot of pushes. Uh, and especially if they do their work well, if it's cash as well. Uh, but yeah, so this is, this, is, um, this is really powerful. And then in terms of keep being useful, they actually have some nice stuff where you can say, so let's check the NX list of uh, NX workspace. I think it is NX workspace, yeah. So if you said no initially, you can say connect to NX Cloud afterwards. So this is something you can buy into afterwards. I'd, I'd recommend you start out with not, and then at some point add it if you feel like you need it. Uh, because this this fast, it's already fast locally. And then if you connect it to NX Cloud, it's fast shared. So with your peers. Uh, then again, if you have a project with like 20 libraries, who cares if your buddy also has to run the same compute because it's not like fast. But if you have a project with 1,000 libraries, you're really happy if somebody else pre preheated like 95 percent of your cache uh let's do this one nx workspace and i think this is where they have the yeah ci workflow you ever created manually a github workflow and liked it i don't think anybody ever says yes to that workspace uh, and what provider do you want? So they also tend to be really agnostic, which is something I appreciate. They're really realistic, like, okay, uh, different people have different choices. 
Now, this is a GitHub workflow that's extremely opinionated. It works around NX. It's also extremely uh, nice because it spins out the work over a, a bunch of agents. Uh, these are just other instances it spins up. So if you push this up, it'll create a main project, like the the main, the puppet master, if you will, plus three of its agents. So it'll actually spin up four boxes on GitHub and it'll parallelize any of these jobs. So it has it is smart to distribute like, okay, uh, I know I need to do, let's say, uh, of 20 libraries, linting, testing, and building, it'll spread it out. And if it knows like, hey, testing of one library is extremely slow because you just do a bunch of tests there, it'll make sure it evens out. And this really helps your uh, performance. And then you can scale horizontally from here. Uh, so I've been on, on projects where we had like eight or nine agents just running, just keep load down. And uh, if you're on a huge team, you'd happily pay GitHub Actions a bunch of money to make your uh, the, the time between commits and deployments shorter. So yeah, pretty cool here. And again, this is just using it the NX way. If you want to do it yourself, you obviously can just build your own um, file. You might not have that big of a benefit. Uh, but most of us probably are familiar with caching your, um, what is it, your NPM or Yarn uh, cache between GitHub runs. Uh, here's the NX cache. This is something else you can just cache locally between runs, and then you'll have the same effect. So it's one of the tools where I, I'm, I'm locking into vendor, and I'm not, I'm not really uh, sad about it. One, because I never feel they kind of upsell. Uh, it's it's I never send the money. Uh, they only uh, make me make a bunch of money. Um, and I think the integration is pretty lightweight. I feel like it's it's as much as a login lock in as picking a, a front end framework or a back end framework for that matter or your database, right? You just have to pick certain technologies. Uh, but I would be sad if it would only work on their hosting provider or sell something like this. That's not great. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I think uh, a quick, um, to, to wrap it up, I mentioned initially, this is not how I tend to build my apps. I, I've i been doing this a bunch and I've always, um, I've always, I'm always interested in building my own stack. And then like, I, I had a job for the last two years. It ended a, about a year ago, but the years, two years before I had a job, so I wouldn't spin up a whole bunch of projects any other week. So I didn't have a default starter. But right now I do, and I have this thing called PubKey Stack. And PubKey Stack is a uh, NX workspace. It's a full stack application, and um, it's kind of my Swiss army knife, I guess, or kitchen sink, however you want to see it. That it does a bunch of things how I always do them. So yeah, I got an API, which is um, a next, uh, no, a nest repo, a nest um, application. And then here I got my front end, and then you can already see, like, first thing I do is import shell feature. Uh, so this is uh, kind of what I'm doing. This is also something we're all aware of, like, yeah, polyfilling the hell out of your app so that uh, wallop adapter works. This is something I do here. And then all of the rest actually lives inside these libraries. And then the structure I'm using here, this is something I can really, I did talk about for hours, and I can and will, if you let me. Uh, talk about for hours, but what, what I came up with and what works right now for me is inside libs divide by app. So because you know that API, ever, whatever you build here is never going to be imported by web. This is also when, when Bagia asked, he's gone now, but when, he's, when he asked like, hey, uh, shared code, if you do it, it needs to be outside of here. Uh, Anchor, this is just my Anchor project. This is just the, the counter project that we scaffold with Create React App, but it's all wired up. And then inside these API, let's look at API because it's simpler. Inside here, I have these top level, uh, as I said, in a, in a huge company, you would call these things domain. So you have a user domain, authentic authentication domain, identity, and then uh, core. And then inside here, my feature in the back end, this is basically my GraphQL resolver. So in here, I do my GraphQL methods, uh, admin create, find many user. The actual, actual actual logic doesn't live here. That all lives in the data access library. Uh, so this is kind of like, yeah, a skinny feature fat model. 
fat data access layer kind of idea. Your, the, the, the meat of your application should be your data access layer that's shared between other things. And there should be no logic in the user facing layer, which in the in the in case of an API, it's either your REST route or your your GraphQL resolvers or like whatever communication TRPC, GRPC, etc. That's user facing, right? From the point of an API. That should have zero logic. It should merely be a definition of what you want to do. And uh, if you look at these things and and see that everything is actually created this way and all of these names are super, super uh, predictable, they all follow the same thing, you already get into the realm of like, why not automate building this? So whenever I pick my stack, and I, I'd love to do a show and tell at some point, like how I build my app, how I actually build them and see how far we can, how fast we can get into like a working full stack app that just does a bunch of stuff. Uh, because that's where the real magic happens. I think uh, if you're interested in looking at this, uh, at some point, check out these tools folder here. This is where I build, a, build my own Annex plugin. And it actually has a bunch of generators. So I can generate Prisma models. I can sync data from Prisma back into my mono repo. So if I add like an enum or a model, I just run the sync full and it'll just create it on the right spot uh, because it can infer names. Uh, API features. So let's say I want to do company again. Uh, I'm just say, hey, give me the a Prisma model company, give me the API feature mod, uh, company and the, and the web feature or CRUD or whatever. Do it and then execute it. And then you're like, hey, why run three? I can actually just create an annex generate feature command and wire them all up, which is the fuck the next step I'm going to go here. But the whole idea is automate the hell out of it, make sure it's consistent. And then with this setup, and then especially if you look like, let's say API, if I want to move my identity functionality over to another platform, I take this folder here and I move it into another app. I wire up the imports. So it, it's part of the compilation and you're done. And with the front end as well, I just go here to web uh, identity and here's a bunch of data access, bunch of hooks. And there's a bunch of uh, UI libraries Etc. You you pack them up and you move them over, and you, you have you hardly have to search for where stuff lives and and wire it up. So yeah, this is I guess uh, uh, most of it. What's what's important? Uh, yeah, I said we can rant on for hours, but I think most most people already left. That's totally uh, understandable. Well, this is awesome. Yeah, thanks for showing that much. I would definitely like to do another one where we take all of this and continue to go build something with it. So that that would be a fun follow up for sure. Seems like seems like an amazing idea. Yeah, I'd love to. And uh, we can we can kind of look at adding a bunch of stuff here. Uh, let's say API. This is this the real life project I just showed this stack. Oh, cool. Uh, and it feature. But you'll see like the, the it, and it makes sense. Like the most most stuff the shares. I know this is web. Most stuff share the same things anyway, like, yeah. And everything shares off. This all makes sense here. But then user access, yeah, there's no reason for identities to import from users, etc. Yeah. So it's, it's really useful once your app gets larger up until certain points where you just understand how these things work. And I right now, I tend to see the same. I just use my editor and, and search for certain structures. But... That is cool. Awesome. Yeah, there's one quick question. Can we have packages inside a package? Um, does that mean like a package can reference another one? Package inside a package, I don't think is possible. I think one, I, I, it might be possible, um, but I don't think it's recommended. Uh, what I do do is I structure things. So as you said, I, as you saw, I don't structure on a plain level. I structure on a... Um, uh, just file a directory based level. So I create hi hierarchy with um, the other way around. So what it actually would look like in my app, so you create one for each app. So let's say web, and then I would create a folder UI and a folder called shell. Now shell is actually a feature, I guess it's user facing a shell data access. Um, and then inside here, I do company data access, company feature, where the routes live uh, feature. And UI. 
and also inside these things naming files so i'm very very much a proponent that any file should have a unique name in your application unless it's not possible let's say index.js package.json tsconfig.json clearly have a name that needs to be this but um i think for instance actual functionality routes etc you should be able to just do a fuzzy find on your keyboard and actually find the file you're looking at just by understanding how it is in my case a great name would be web shell feature .tsx because i know it's a web and then i know it's in the shell domain and i know it's a feature Whereas web shell UI for me lives in the web app shell domain UI feature. But then if you only have a web app, why preface everything with apps? So if you're not interested in also at some point adding like an admin app or a website app or, or a, a mobile app, why add this thing everywhere? So this is clearly like a, a, a huge, it depends. If you have like files with TSX, you're sure this front end React frameworks. So you don't really have to preface it with uh, web UI button .tsx. I can just call the thing UI button .tsx. But if you now add a mobile app like React Native, where the implementation of the button is actually different, you're happy that you prefixed everything with mobile because you're not going to by accident like import from the wrong library and like screw things up in in production. So yeah, don't think we can have package and package uh, bug, yeah, but we can do like hierarchy in these things. Uh, uh, yeah, actually I really like this way of uh, having folders uh, and packages inside them. Uh, actually I didn't do it, uh, but I will now do it this way. One, one thing that I uh, faced while migrating the code base, you know uh, that I am migrating uh, my <laughs> different apps into NX. So I created a UI package and I have an admin app and a, uh, a different front-end app, right? So I have two front-end apps. And in the UI package, what I did, I create a, a common uh, folder, uh, which contains all the common components that can be shared by both the apps. And I created a admin app folder and a, a second app folder that I have. And then I configure different paths to all of them in TS config. So I have UI, slash component slash admin app ui slash component slash uh, the other app ui slash component uh, so uh, is it a good approach or i should instead do your way like having uh, folders defining different apps and then a ui package inside a, a, every uh, app fo uh, folder yeah that's a great question so in my opinion you should never have to touch these ones with a few exceptions, but if you in actually normal usage, if it feels like a separate package, it's, it probably is. And even though they create a bunch of files, packages are cheap in the sense of like they're easy to, to generate, they're easy to manage. You can actually rename and read just Kudo, figure that out. Uh, I saw your question and you found the answer. Like you can actually move around packages, which is in, oh, yeah. in essence a rename, right? Uh, so in comment. your case, Yep, you can. Yeah, yeah, can can do all of that stuff um, uh, with just NX generate. And uh, so, in your case, if you want to have like three different entry points here, so let's say you you said okay, UI admin, uh, let's say UI web and UI site for the like public facing website, you do it inside here. What you actually really probably want is just create three different libraries and then maybe a common one that they um, that they depend on. There is not one thing to say though, and but I would I would prevent I would try to prevent touching this as much as I would try to prevent touching uh, any of the files outside of SRC unless you know you really need it. Uh, one thing we do in the, um, in the create react in the create Solana dev is to accommodate uh, Next.js devs has actually created something like this, the dollar slash I think it's this. Now it can import from the own app. Um, I, I oh, tend to like the star pattern to import directly. Yeah, so you can, but like in this sense, in, and what I explained, for me, it never makes sense to import something from an app because an app is only like an entry point. I think if you need this logic somewhere else, you should pull it into a library. Now for create uh, Solana dev, we clearly don't want to spin up like a whole complex structure. We just want to make an easy entry point that works. Uh, and it happens to power be powered by Next, so we added this thing. So Next users feel at home. It's like one of these exceptions. 
Um, another exception I had was actually, I probably is in my repo here. Uh, where's this thing? In PubKey. So one of the things I have here is that my API, I, I'm huge on end-to-end -end tests, especially for my backend. Uh, so in my backend, what I do, <clears throat> it's all based on GraphQL. So I have just an initializer for my GraphQL SDK and I'm testing the hell out of my SDK. So for instance, doing any type of um, uh, user access, can users do anything with this API? For me, that all lives here. So users should be able to update all of this good stuff. I got a generator for this. So if I generate a new feature, it'll also generate like an end-to-end -end test. But the reason I touch on this, I need to import my app from here for some reason. I don't, I forgot why. It's not super relevant why, but I needed this. So I got like one exception here. Oh, I actually got rid of the, it's no longer needed. Okay, I used to have one exception here where I import from the app, but looks like I got rid of it. But yeah, this is what a what a, an app tends to look, tends to end up. And then, yeah, you can just take stuff. If you want to use your Solana in your own feature, look at 3 t look no further. You'll have everything you need. That's not totally true because I also depend on my UI course. Now you have to implement whatever I do in the shared UI. Um, okay, uh, I, I have one more question. So I, I have a services package, which have like multiple services like Redis and uh, let's say Stripe and something like that. And I'm uh, having that star pattern, like uh, uh, my organization slash services slash star, mm -hmm. so that I can import a certain, pa so let's say, uh, instead of importing, uh, let's say I just want a Redis, so I can import like my org slash services slash Redis only so that I uh, have Redis uh, things only. Uh, so is it a good pattern or should we uh, have everything exported from my index file and then uh, when we are using uh, anything, uh, any any of the service, we just import it like my org slash services. And uh, because in this pattern, what issue I was facing is that I don't want to uh, import everything uh, in a particular file when I just need the Redis uh, right. from that service? That's a great question. So um, considering it's Redis and it's uh, talking about Redis database, Stripe, etc., you're most likely uh, doing this on the back end. And then luckily there, it doesn't really matter if you import like the whole library or even one because it doesn't really change. It's not a load that you have to send to the user. On the front end, you clearly want to be really specific and don't send any payload to the user they don't need. Um, that said, these things, uh, this index here, the idea is that this index here, this defines your public API. So this defines whatever you get used outside of it. These are the files you cannot change without telling your peers, hey, there's a breaking change here. And then inside logic, like however you structure it down here, that's private, so that's none of the concern. You should be able to, to change any inner workings in the library without um, breaking the public API. It kind of depends, again, on your app, uh, but this is a, a general good practice. Uh, doing deep imports is generally not a great uh, practice. Now, if you want to be specific about it, if you only want to import one thing, let's say only Stripe and not Redis, and it hurts you, you most likely want to have separate package. And this is something like, if if in doubt, in, in NX, the answer very likely is going to be, yeah, just create a new package for this. And I was hesitant, like, am I only going to have a package for only my routes and my layout wiring together? Yeah, actually, you're, you are. you are, And that's, and at some point, you'll like it. Um, okay, so for yeah, each services answer. in my service package, I can have a separate package. You can have separate library, if you will. So you can say, let's. Let, I know it's 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 probably uh, React. It's next project, or you have a backend with. Uh, but I would do it something like so this. Backend only. I'm using Next.js API routes. Right? Yeah. Okay. But it's a uh, it's in a separate directory. So let's say the uh, services uh, Redis. This is one way to go about it. Services slash Redis. So call the package service Redis and uh, service stripe. Uh, I called stripe, but we get it, right? Uh, and then the other one, let's call it Prisma. So, 
instead of uh, defining services as a package it can be just a folder name and inside that i can have every uh, uh, se uh, se uh, se separate service as a uh, package yeah you can but yeah. the, the the beauty is you can uh, you can structure it the way you want it but building a package inside here like with its own package JSON and tests etc that's not something that i think is supported so this this services folder that I got here, this is just really a, a placeholder. It's really a folder to add hierarchy to your um, uh, libraries, but nothing than nothing besides this. So we'll never say NX build services because it's um, it's not a unique identity. It's just really a folder. Um, but you what you what it does allow you to do if you tag these things properly. So I'm, I showed these tags in project JSON. You can, for instance, only build your packages with a certain tag uh, or only lint these things or add rules like hey these services can never import from each other which 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 might be sensible for your app does that help uh, yeah Bagia? makes sense yeah thank you and let's actually see so we can say service uh, strip is actually service stripe because this happens a lot dash d is uh, dry run what does it miss uh, okay oh, we can do Press. this i didn't know i thought yeah, you can rename manually this yeah i'm just looking up the destination i'm just looking up the syntax here uh yeah it'll say now oh hmm what should be the new project name this pro this this uh prompt here asking for derived and as provided is really ugly and it'll be gone in three months and then you have to just specify it, which I think is, is better. Uh, but let's say the folder moved project into, I'm going to add this ugly as hell parameter <laughs> as provided. I am the NX plugin of VS Core <laughs> because it's like uh, easy to, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It. And definitely use this VS code plugin if, if that's, uh, this is what we actually want to do. Yeah. Is it, is it services? Yeah, this is what we actually want to do. So it, it now just renames the whole bunch. But yes, this, this uh, NX move, and it's just like Linux and, and Unix system, right? A move is a rename. It's the same thing. Uh, but yeah, now we're here, and now we should have removed this thing. Should have changed it. Yeah. But then clearly the stuff inside here, it didn't update this, uh, uh, the actual files. But yeah, it does change the position of it and like references here this ah this also not updated so yeah some things it does some things it does not update correctly yeah ev3 finally gonna go to your question here uh good resources yes i think uh nx dev is uh pretty good their documentation is uh pretty spot on in a lot of things like one thing that i always looked up before they created generate was how to do tailwind luckily so it used to be like this all these manual instructions but now it's just this uh, nx generator here set up tailwind also works for your next step uh so yeah that's nx dev and then uh youtube you see um here there's jack uh zach pardon uh, all right they have a, a bunch of uh great content they have a bunch of good dev rails and uh they have very interesting stuff here uh, Yuri, this one's also really good. He has great content. Uh, and they go about everything. If you want to build your own uh, CLI, for instance. <clears throat> so NX, next to being a monorepo tool and uh, doing code scaffolding, you can actually leverage all of these pieces and build your own CLI. This is what we use to build um, uh, Create Solana Dep. So Create Solana Dep is a bunch of packages. It's linked up together. We use NX to scaffold. And one of the, the new features I'm actually working on at the moment is allow you to extend the functionality. So if you want to do like a new anchor program with its front end, that should be one command, just like give me another counter, but call it uh, a counter too. It'll just set it up, put it all in place, add the route, add the navigation. Uh, we do whatever we can to make it fast. And um, so, and the, the meat is here, how to do your own CLI. Another thing, if you're into front-end and front-end testing, check Storybook. They have an amazing Storybook integration where you actually 
to write front end tests and your storybook in the same project. So you you basically build your storybook examples, but they also serve as your end to end tests for your front end, hmm. which I think is pretty cool. So yeah, this is a great resource. Uh, Kudo mentioned I also got my own channel. It's a it's a bit dated, so that's um, that's not a big issue if you think about like. Um, uh, uh, naming, strategy, etc., structuring, uh, but just don't copy the commands, as the commands won't work anymore. But the whole idea around how to how to structure these things, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of this uh, right here, and um, most of this uses an X at, in some shape or form. Uh, I got Zach on here; he's a buddy of mine. Uh, we talked about this uh, as well. Uh, Prisma. Uh, Prisma is another thing, really life-changing tool for me. Use it for years. So you find a bunch of of Prisma stuff as well. And actually, also TRPC uh, had a great chat with Alex al almost like uh, two years ago, two years and a bit. Beard, beard a bit shorter and darker, but yeah, that's uh, <laughs> all of that good stuff. I really like to pick it up at some point. It's just uh, I got a ton of other stuff to do, as with most people have. With seeing your routing thinking in that React app, with TRPC, would you make your router like a separate package from your procedures? How, or do you know how modular uh, you would go with that? We, in this example, actually, we talked about um, TRPC itself, and we just uh, picked his uh, demo app NX. And and in all fairness, I, I never used it in, um, in my own project. I okay. only played around with it. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I would put it in a separate package. If it makes sense, I probably will. I, I will go far to try and make my apps as tiny as possible. But then on the contrary, let's take let's take a look at this one again because this is this is basically my latest best practices and these things change over the years. So it's it's unlikely that a year from now something didn't change here. But one of the things I used to all split up is basically define your app. So you bootstrap in this case a next a nest uh, API, but Express has the same. Like, yeah, is this a real, is this its own app or isn't it? Like, yeah, I mean, you can argue to put it in your own library. If there's a benefit to it, well, not really. To figure out a name and whatever. I mean, it, yeah. it stops somewhere. <laughs> where's Where's the line? Yeah, TRPC is interesting because <laughs> it's like making your server, but then you're also making methods other servers can call, but then you also have an yeah. SDK. So, yeah. Another, another kind of question where, where's the line is when you're making these um, like anchor apps where it seems like your UI is top level and your like anchor program is kind of like sub level that that feels weird to me but I understand how we're using the package JSON to you know kind of tie it all together um, yeah it, are you structuring anything differently when using a mono repo like can you put the rest stuff somewhere else and like the UI somewhere else and it still works I mean what I, how I see it, but this is also uh, like Dan, who was here earlier, a huge NX user, also like defaults to NX for years. He was like, yeah, for me, Anchor is, Anchor is an application because it's it's a program. And yeah. uh, when I when I saw his project, I, got, I get the reasoning. For me, it's a library because um, it doesn't have a port where it listens on. So this for me, like, how do you consider an app? Well, for me, in this context of this monorepo and this workflow, an app is something that exposes a port and that I can visit here. But yeah, it's a huge honor to have you here, bro. Uh, you should go uh, You should go to sleep probably, or just go till like 7 a.m. and take breakfast and continue with your Sunday. That's, that's I don't know. <laughs> uh, Bagya is uh, one of my buddies from the Dean's List DAO server and the- oh, cool. uh, he, he joined here. Actually, yeah. I have to migrate. Uh, so, so API and my admin app is already migrated to NX successfully. Like I have uh, built them and uh, like manually run them because I have not uh, written the test for them yet uh, that I should. But because we are building fast, so I didn't get the time to write test. So I have to manually test after building them that everything is working fine. So now... Uh, on Sunday, I will have to migrate the other uh, front end, the user facing front end app to NX, and then uh, we can build further uh, into the NX app. Uh, and I really love the uh, NX structure. I first uh, used Turbo, uh, and I I really faced some issues with multiple package.json when I was migrating APIs and all. 
so then i reached out to you and asked about nx and all firstly i uh, when i uh, went through the nx website and documentation it felt tough to me then turbo uh, uh, turbo repo right but uh, when i started migrating with turbo repo uh, then i thought that this multiple package json thing is really weird and uh, confusing because uh, when i was doing them uh, i i fa- uh, get into this cyclic dependency issue as well but with nx uh, because it's just has one package json and every uh, package you can import uh, every in a, any app and uh, library so it's really good and whenever i am doing a uh, uh, issue with cyclic dependency where i am like uh, importing from app to package and uh, package to app it is giving me lint error so i i don't uh, i am not getting that cyclic dependency issue during the build time of app instead i am getting it while writing it uh, in the uh, d- due to the lint uh, thing so it was really helpful in nx and i really uh, i am really loving nx so far and uh, I I also faced that issue with uh, the uh, thing where I wanted a path uh, for the for my app, but that got solved when I discussed with you uh, uh, regarding that. Uh, but but there was one thing I had to disable uh, lint rule for that because there is one lint uh, rule in NX which uh, says that you should only use absolute pa. Uh, uh, like absolute imports inside a app so i had to disable it to use the relative uh, import but i think that's fine uh, for the easiness yeah but i think in a if i had to build an nx uh, uh, a next app in nx i would probably only have the routes there like the only file system structure that needs to be there and these in my apps would all import from fe- from libs from feature libs basically yeah I'm doing that way now so i have a ui uh, ui package and uh, there's only the routes that are defined i have hooks in a separate yeah. package utils in a separate package services in a sec- separate package and uh, i am but after uh, this session i will refactor some of the code according to this directory yeah. structure i think yeah, that will make it much better yeah yeah, and because you're part of Dean's list now, you can that uh, just uh, on one-on-ones with me. That's uh, that's fine. And also happy for others, by the way, to uh, to look at your app and structure it. It's uh, yeah. So maybe if you are free, early next week, as we discussed, maybe when we will get on a call regarding the business visa thing, we can uh, yeah. just have a look on my refactor. Because till then, I will refactor complete thing. So maybe you will have some more suggestions on it and uh, uh, you, you'll keep case. on refactoring that's part of our job job security right you should do it right all at once you should just keep on <laughs> improving over time refactor forever yeah. that's it <laughs> all right well should we wrap this up i think yeah probably it, a good mark it's been great. all right cool well yeah thanks Beeman. this is awesome we'll keep these going i'm stuck to get this started awesome. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, for hosting this, for bringing up the idea. It's been a while since I did the show and tell, and I really like it. So uh, can't wait to see who's next.